Thank you for that warm welcome. That's awesome. Dropping my notes here. So, so yeah, I also have never actually eaten in kosher bites, but I've heard a lot of stories about it. I'm trying to figure out if it's an urban legend that they're just like laxatives or not. I can't, I can't figure it out. Everyone tells me, like, don't go to kosher bites before you drive back to New York. Not a good idea. <laughs> Everyone. Yes, people are laughing. This side, I told the laughers to sit on this side because I saw some people with the arm crossing and I like, didn't want to have like the single section or whatever. No, no, you, you can cross your arms. It's good. I, I have to like, you know, work on my delivery. So, so anyway, like Purim is coming up, right? So, yeah, yeah, Purim, yeah, Hannah Sester, then. Um, so, so Purim, I have the awkward, the most awkward time with shalak monos because I'm poor and I don't really give them, but people give them to me. And I'm just trying to figure out how to work that whole awkward moment when they give you this like basket with tissue paper and with those Israeli wafers sticking out, and you're like, uh, hi, you know? There's no, I don't even have a recycle table. Growing up, I had the recycle table. All the stuff I didn't want. And my dad said, okay, where's the recycle table? Where's the stuff we don't want? And we'd like stall the person while we ran it back and got like one of those baskets with the name written on it, cross it out, and write their name. <laughs> I love this guy and like cross it out and like he's already drunk for Purim, this is great. And he would cross it out and he'd like run up and have like, you know, someone stalling and we'd gather all like the junk, like fruit. Who the heck wants fruit? Shalach Manos with fruit is just, it's gotta go. Fruit and Shalach Manos? The Israeli wafers, until I went to Israel, I thought the Israeli wafers were like the hottest commodity in Shalach Manos. And then I realized for one Agarot you get like a truckload. Every Makola has like a truckload of Israeli wafers. and. Me and my brother, when we found that out after going to Israel, we just dumped it in the recycle pile. I hear people talking, no disturbing, close the door. Yeah, okay. So, <laughs> so yeah, we, we would have that recycle pile, and we'd like always, but we always gave, we had like, we believed in kind of being like the Chinese government. Like, we would give much less back, you know, than they would give. We always wanted to be like in the, uh, you know, the plus. So we would just like give up this huge thing. They love the tissue paper and they love all those like designs coming out. There's nothing in the shalak monos. There's like wafers and there's those little like cigar wafers that are just fancier wafers with the chocolate. You know, you eat them and you feel all cool, but they're not cool. They're just wafers. That's it. And the packaging takes forever to open. And when you do open it, it ends up being all those crumbs in the bottom. And it's never like the full cigar. You never get the full thing. It's not there. You know what I'm talking about? Those fancy rolly wafers, no one, they know, this guy knows, that's right. So, so we'd have that like whole shalak monos, like awkward moment. And it kind of reminds me of when like, when, when I was younger and I didn't realize you had to tip people for carrying your luggage at the airport. You know, I would never go to the side baggage people if I knew you had to tip them. I mean, I can go inside for two bucks, I would wait online. It's kind of like they're standing there and you're like, hi, what are you, what are you waiting for? You know, they're just like, their arms out. But they don't do that. Shalak monos is the greatest thing because it's a shliach. You don't have to deal with the actual person. Although I'm sure the shliach goes back to like, dude, they chipped us off. We gave them like one of those O nuts baskets that was like 75 bucks. We got nothing. We got an orange and one of those little Kedem grape juices. That's it. It's like bad, bad, like, you know, stuff going on. So also about Purim this year, I, I heard, um, there, there's actually like, I hope this doesn't offend you, man. I know this is, this is going bare, but affirmative action for Hamantashans. More politically correct, prune and poppy. I happen to be a prune fan. I know I might be like, I heard that under 70 year olds aren't supposed to like prune, but I am a prune fan. Poppy, on the other hand, I don't know where poppy came from. How did poppy get into the whole hummantashen thing? Thank you, dry mouth. Um, poppy, it's like having chocolate chips. The chocolate chips and the hummantashens, doesn't work, man. Doesn't work. I want straw, it does, you like it? It's not a hummantashen then, it's a cookie. <laughs> The whole point of a hamantashen is that there's that jelly like in the inside that drips onto your like costume. The whole point of it. There's no point of cookie stuff. It's, it's it's just and people these days don't even put enough jelly in it anymore. You have to like you have to like compensate. You have to eat around and make sure you have enough cake to jelly ratio to fulfill the cake in there. It just doesn't always you know it, to me it it doesn't suffice. Oh, they're leaning over already. They're like crossing their arms. I'm gonna do it, man. It's gonna work. Okay, I'll do some Baltimore material, man. So in Baltimore, man, in Baltimore, I always love Baltimore because people say good Shabbos to you. Being from New York, if someone says good Shabbos to you, you, you like, you're like, oh, oh my God, what? 
what do you want? What do you want from me? It's usually like, oh, you're single, I have a girl for you. Like walking down the street, of course, always, they love that. But in Baltimore, people take a chance, but I figured out recently why. It has nothing to do with you guys being friendly. No, nothing to do with it. The sidewalks are so damn narrow here that like in order to pass someone, it, it, you, have to, you have to say to Shabbos as an excuse me. It's like that at weddings too. People don't say mazel tov to you because they want to like, you know, say mazel tov. They say mazel tov because they either don't want to talk to you or they want to like go through you, you know? There's no such thing as just like friendly greeting anymore. Every greeting was, is used as like, good vach, good vach is like, good vach, good vach. You know, shabbat tov. Shabbat tov is like heads down, running along. You know, trying to get home to turn on their cell phones because everyone's got to put in a Bluetooth. Yeah, I love those people. You're sitting in Abdullah in shul and there's a Bluetooth in their ear. Where did it, it like came out of the talus bag. They were carrying it all Shabbos long to put it on. It's like the ultimate feeling. There's one instance of Bluetooth feeling that I bought a Bluetooth today, by the way. Brand new to the whole Bluetooth talking to yourself thing. Someone, someone called me a hypocrite for it because I'm very anti like Bluetooth Bluetooth people like in the banks. They're like screaming on their phones. I, I am just, okay, Baltimore sidewalks. So Baltimore sidewalks, the other problem with Baltimore sidewalks are the strollers in Baltimore. Because in Baltimore, people are of a lower socioeconomic uh, status compared to New York. So a lot of the strollers here don't turn, the wheels don't turn in front. <laughs> so they can't move. So even if you say good shops, and there's always that awkward, that awkward you're late to shul and you're walking with all the women strollering. And they know, they know you didn't go to the early minion. They know you're, you, you got up late, and you're trying, you're going, it feels like you're walking right behind them, but you can't speed up that fast. And then you're like, you're trying to overtake them, and they're just like, they're, they're moving along, really like at a swift pace, and you can't walk into the street because it's in like Reisterstown Road or something, there's cars flying by, and you can't do the whole sidewalk thing because they're really from, and if you touch them, there might be some sort of like, you know, issue or something, but you can't say good Shabbos because they might not say good Shabbos to you back. I have no idea what to do because they put the telephone poles right in the middle of the sidewalks here too. They love doing that. They love like messing with the whole... Women, I hear, spend enough time researching their stroller options like they can, you know, buy a new house with it. Like, it's like, he's shaking his head. Spend like five, six hundred bucks. You might as well get like 24 inch spinning rims with a stroller, you know? Might as well like, you know, be pimping stroller, like pimp my stroller, you know? You have like self self uh, cleaning cup holders for clements. Be great, man. Um, and like the the handbrakes. I always thought there should be like stroller like um like um, airbags on the sides, like in case you have a rollover. Right? You got a bump. You got one of those tree roots that kind of like up up the sidewalk, and you flip over. Your kid goes flying. But imagine if it had like an airbag that just popped out. Though I bet you it'd be usser for Shabbos. So you know you know it might be bad. Um, we're just flipping around here. This is what happens when people knock my notes down. Purim. More Purim. Um, what? Kosher bite? I've never eaten at Kosher bite. Though I ate at Carmel's. Everyone told me for years not to eat at Carmel's. They, they told me not to eat at Kosher bite. Th there are people that like this, though. There's always, like, the, the, like, the um, anti-conformists, like the people who hated Titanic. You know, after Titanic was really popular, and then there became a few people creeping in. Titanic sucks. I don't like Titanic. I was like, Titanic's the best movie ever. It's awesome. It's just such a romantic, good movie. I couldn't get the song out of my head for like three years afterwards. It's, it was great. And, you know, the same thing I think is with Kosher Biden Karma. I've never actually eaten there because no one has, they've always prevented me from going. Like, you don't want to do that to yourself, Carmel. So one time I went to Carmel because toes burnt down and Mama Leia's was way too far. It was like way out in the middle of nowhere. So only the, they only cater to the yeshiva crowd. So, and, and I don't understand because it's so darn expensive how they can afford that. So they have like a monopoly. The whole, it's, 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 it's Stalinistic to me. It's like, like they know the yeshiva guys don't really all have cars. They know they have to come there and they jack up the prices all the way. So lunch special is like 15 bucks for a piece of pizza. Like it's deep dish, it's good. I like that thick doughy stuff. Oh my God, you bite in, you feel like you're eating that like challah, challah that didn't actually cook. Actually, this Shabbos I ate at someone's house, and he had, you know, like this whole wheat challah. But you know that like whole wheat challah that tastes really bad. It just was, it wasn't. It was like real whole wheat challah. You know, they have the preservative whole wheat challah that like says unbleached wheat, but you know, it's it's probably like wheat that happens to be brown. And this guy had, and everyone's complimenting him. You know, is that pause? And everyone's like, wow, this is really good challah. I'm like, this challah is horrible. <laughs> you know. And I don't want to say anything because he said it was homemade. And I'm like, oh, man. Like, I'm like, yeah, great challah. This is awesome. And then he says, he pops out. He's like, oh, man, I didn't make this challah. It's from the 
from the freezer or whatever. I'm like, oh, dude, your chal, I thank God, because it stunk. This is the worst chal I've ever had. I was like eating into it. I felt like an animal when I was eating it. It was like, it was like, it was like tempa. Does anyone eat, eat, eat tempa? No? You don't do it? Got the tempa look. But tempa, tempa's like animal food. It's just, it's not possible. It's like, it's like three-year-old matzah that they serve at shawl shooters. That's what it is. With the fish balls, you know? Or with the herring. I don't understand why matzah, speaking of matzah, like I was thinking about this recently, matzah that's not kosher in Pesach, I don't, I, it, it boggles my mind. Like, how can this not be kosher? It's always the best matzah that's not kosher in Pesach either. It's, it's never like the junky, sh, you know, shmura matzah that's like three inches thick from Borough Park. That's kosher in Pesach. But the good, like, everything matzah, the stuff with flavor, matzah tam-tams, matzah tam-tams aren't kosher in Pesach, no like not used for Passover. I'm like, it's matzah. Who would ever want to eat this besides for cows? Maybe they do feed it to cows. Maybe it's cows as organic feed. I don't know. But I, I just, it drives me nuts. Actually, this past Pesach, I actually made it through the Seder for the first time without like falling asleep or, you know, getting into a temper tantrum or something because <laughs> there was a girl I thought was playing footsie with me. She wasn't, but I thought she was. So I was sitting there the whole time. She kicked me a couple times, but I think it was because it was a narrow table. But I made up this whole fantasy during Maga that she was actually, you know, playing footsie with me. And I'm sitting there, and I started inching my foot up real, like, real close to hers. I don't know if it was hers or the guy next to hers, but I, it was in my head. I wanted it to be. So, like, I was, like, sitting there, and I was, like, inching my foot up. I was, like, right at the point where if she moved at all, she would kick me. I was, like, yes, it's you. You're playing footsie. And I kept, like, looking at her, and I was, like, peeking out from my, my Haggadah, seeing, catching eyes. Nothing, but I thought. And then I Facebooked her afterwards. Because that's what you do. You Facebook someone after you meet them, only if you like had a crush on them. But that was the last we spoke after the whole like, hi, I met you at the Seder, expecting something back. Like, hey, I was playing footsie with you. So it didn't happen. It did not happen. But, but, but I, I love Facebook because I have like 2,400 friends now. They're not friends. They think they're my friend. They friend me. You, it, you guys don't have Facebook, right? You know what Facebook is? He does. Does anyone not know what Facebook is? Because this will this will just... You don't? Dude, that's a black velvet yarmulke, that's why. <laughs> got a six piece or a four piece? You gotta look on the front, the six piece are extra from, and if you have a rim, even frommer. I hear like going, what? You have four piece and rim, that's like, okay. Okay, you're getting there. Maybe, maybe because you're younger. Your head's not big enough to fit the six piece yet. I think that's what it is. What? Your parents, they took you here, they paid the full price. For the kids, no, he, snuck he snuck in. You snuck in. You like you're you're. Do you like scalp tickets outside? <laughs> what? He's not your father. Who you came here alone? You hitchhiked? I mean, you're extra from. You're, you're starting to hitchhike already. They start them young. Muncie? I lived in Muncie. They start them out at six years old. You stop at a red light. Sixteen kids get in your car. Hey, they start talking Yiddish. All they know is like straight, straight. I'm like. Where did you come from? I don't even have seats in this car. They're like all like hanging on. I'm like a bus in Asia. It's great. And um, yeah, six piece yarmulke. I, I, the worst thing about wearing like a specific type of yarmulke is when you lose the yarmulke. It's when you lose the yarmulke, and women, women wouldn't know this. Because when you lose your shape, you just pick up a fall or a hat or a baseball hat or whatever. You lose a yarmulke, and you have to switch. Switching and switching to a style that you didn't wear before is like it's like it's like. Um, it's like coming out of the closet almost. It's, it's almost the same thing. You hate it, right? You wear, I, wear, I wear suede. One time I went velvet for like a week. A week. People were offering me shidduchim. I got better service in the pizza store. People are coming up to me like, oh, did you get just get back from yeshiva? I'm like, no difference. I had like hair down on my shoulders by the black velvet. I was on my way to drinking the punch. You know, it's like I didn't drink it all yet. But like I was almost there. And it was, it, you know, and when I, opposite, when I went knit, I think he's. I think he started driving on Shabbos. I'm like, my yarmulke is knit. I'm like hardcore Sioni. I wasn't, but you know, I am. I am. Who's the tank driver? Who's the tank guy? Yeah, yeah. presented, man, dude. I got. I just gotta say, man, Israel has two great things, dude. Israel, the toilets flush, and you know they flush, and they always flush, and they like shoot up at you, and the bathroom doors lock. 
Seriously, you can never not lock an Israeli bathroom door because you're like turning and turning and turning. You're like, when's it gonna stop? When's it gonna stop? In America, you got those like little things like on the side that you're not really sure, and you're sitting there the whole time. You're like, and the second someone walks past you, like you stick out your foot, and you're like <laughs> sitting there. That's the worst. I hate. I, I, I think like my, my absolute worst nightmare is like walking in on someone in the bathroom that you're staying in their house. The wife, the, the husband's fine. It's like, oh hey, what's up? We in the Jewish press. Yeah, take care of the wife. <laughs> <laughs> freak out, freak out. It's, it's like the worst thing. The other worst thing I, I fear in, in people's houses is like, I call it the underwear effect. Like I like sleeping in my underwear because I grew up in like an underwear family. I know mean, you don't want to hear this, right? And like my whole family, like we grew up with all men, so we all walk around in underwear. And um, the worst thing is like when I'm like have to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night and the bathroom is a little further than you think you can run back if you see someone in the hall. And, you know, like, I have this debate. I, I'm like, I really got to go to the bathroom. Is it worth putting on clothing? And, or, or can I make it there and make it back without anyone spotting me? Like, a middle-of-the-night hostess of the house underwear meetup is not good. It's like, it's, it's one of those things that just... And, and it's, luckily, it's never happened, though. The thing that does happen all the time is that, like, when they, tell, when they don't say specifically that you can go in their fridge and raid their fridge... I like that. I, I think like the suspense is good. Like sitting there with your head like in the tin, trying to separate the kugel from the apple cobbler. I don't know how that became kugel, by the way. The apple cobbler kugel should remain dessert. I don't like it mixed in with the potato and that. You know, it just doesn't work. And like separating them and you're in there and you're never using utensils because you can't find them. And then someone's like, you know, the forks are right above your head. And you're like, oh yeah, yeah I was just looking for a drink. And then, Right, you're like raiding our fridge. In some people's houses, like they, they, when they say specifically, it's not fun. When they say like you can go in the fridge, I don't even want to go in the fridge. It's like you just legalize it. I want to go in the pantry, open up those like organic pita chips that were like six ninety nine at Whole Foods. That's what I want to eat. And you're, and they're like, oh, uh, um, you, you, you know we have leftovers in the fridge. And you're like chowing down on those like, like sun dried tomato chips with that like Rothschild Farms like honey mustard that cost like eight bucks in, in the back of Marshalls that was on sale from 16. You guys ever shop in the back of Marshalls? The back of Marshalls is the best for giving people gifts. For like, she's not her, right? Those vases, people think you spent like a hundred bucks. You bring them and you, if you don't forget the thing, it's like six ninety nine made in China. But like you, you get there, it's so much better. The best gift if you want to make women happy is Moscato di Asti. It's been like that for years. I mean, someone's going to have to come out with like a, a, from, a frummer wine. You know, because Moscato di Asi, like women, they eat that stuff up. But I was at a meal on Shabbos where the men were admitting that they liked it. I, I kind of debated their orientations for a little bit. Um, they, they were saying, and, and then I realized they were all very, it was a very, pro, it was very progressive. I'm a little progressive. But it was like, I had three rabbinical students at my table. I had JTS, YCT, Chove Torah, and YU. And they all agreed with each other. So I decided it was like the Democrats or Republicans. They, like, there was no opinions going on. And the guy who knew the most was the YCT guy, which was shocking because in the Orthodox community, it's like, YCT is bad, it's evil. Like they're taking away people from other things. You know, there's all this competition. YCT is Chove Torah, you're, you're wondering? Oh, you know what it is? Good. Rabbi Weiss. Rabbi Weiss, that's right. Chove Torah, that's right. You have what? Oh, good guy. I saw him speak in Albany. It's really good. Hardcore. I won't talk anymore about it. No, I'm joking. Um, I, I have really nothing, nowhere to go with that story. But I, I'm, so I'm, I'm like, uh, I'm shit updating. I don't even know if I'm shit updating. I'm just like, go on Facebook, like find a hot chick and like email her. But like, or they find me actually. I like the Facebook stalkers. I have some here. I won't point them out. But, um, but I love when they come out of the woodwork. She's laughing. It's great. Good. I'm glad. I won't point you out though. She, she stalks me all the time. Every Facebook status update, I like this update, and I want to date you. No, it, it, it doesn't say that, but it almost says that. And um, so I, I always tell the shopman that I want open-minded. You know, I want an open-minded girl. I don't want her, like, you know, throwing me to the wolves every time I don't wear a suit to shul or wear sandals or whatever. And I, I, I went out with a girl the other night who um, I asked her, you know, I asked just basic questions like, where do you go to shul? And I really don't ask that, but she just moved to the city in Upper West Side, whatever. She's like, I go to a Baptist shul. <laughs> What's a Baptist shul? A Baptist shul in a Presbyterian church. I found that kind of weird. It was a pretty big mix. I'm like, you go to a Baptist church shul in a church? And it was very odd. I was sitting there. I was like, I was, I was planning on like going to the bathroom, calling up the person. I was like, I want someone religious. I don't want a girl that goes to church. This is just totally weird. And then this other shot from the other night, 
I found that like the shotgun, I'm, like I find that shotgun I'm asked like the most random questions. They never asked me those like tablecloth questions, you know, like what color is your tablecloth? I've never ever met anyone that was asked that question. I've never met anyone that was asked if you use red or white horseradish or drink Dr. Brown's or seltzer on Shabbos. I was never, that, that, that's never been asked of me. I think those are just urban legends made up in Lakewood somewhere to like drive like, you know, animosity between modern and yeshivish like crowds so they can like clash and you know, make fun of each other and stuff and make Shabbos tables more interesting. I think that's like the whole whole point of it. But I was asked by a shotgun for the first time in my life. This guy's so bored. I was asked by the shotgun if I smoked pot. I was like, wow, that's the most rant. Like, it's like, he's laughing. <laughs> Shotgun's like, do you smoke pot? I was like, no. That's so weird. That's like almost as bad as the tablecloth, I guess. She's like, well, are you marijuana friendly? I'm like, that's like, are you pet friendly? That would be great to sell you a sign question. You're like, I like pets, I don't like them, I, I don't even talk about pets. I smoke weed, I don't smoke weed, I want legalization, or whatever. It'd be like a good like thing like on the sell you at Sinai thing. Actually, sell you at Sinai is running through some um, economic trouble these days. I'll explain. Sell you at Sinai is like an um, online shidduch outsourcing you know, conglomerate where they, you know, they, they like... Instead of like going to meet your, your girl through a, through a normal traditional matchmaker, you go online and you talk to a compu computer screen of someone who you've never met, yet knows exactly who you want. And, and through answering a series of checklists, like I do agree, I disagree, it's like a sample set. It's like, a, you know, like, a, like they're adding diseases to the DSM or something. It'd be the same thing. And, and they, um, they uh, started outsourcing their shotgun to India. <laughs> so, so now when you call up, it's like, hello, may I help you? Yes, perfect girl. She's so wonderful. Yeah, her father goes to a great school. It's great. No, no 7-Eleven franchise. No, no. So it's, it's like Gupta instead of Kaya. It's great. It's, it, like I call my bank up. Like you call up your shop and they're like, can I have your birthday for com like confirmation? What's your street address? Okay. Yes, I know a girl in that area. You know, it's just, it's so impersonal that now it's going to be even much more impersonal. That's the, like slowing of economy. I have like a whole bunch of ideas of like, you know, ways for, for um, in, Cle in Cleveland actually, the congregation, start, some of the shuls started doing like natural gas drilling. That's true. But I had a whole theory, like alternative energies, like the way to go in shuls can harness this. None of you are shuckling right now. He's moving his arms because he's got ADD. But none of you are actually like, you know, doing the shuckle. If you put like little windmills by the shucklers, the really violent, you know, those guys that like, they, not the guys that like push off the stenders, the guys that are like, crazy if you like walk right near them you get that whole like bullet graze thing going on you put like windmills by those guys are attached electrodes to their nipples or something to harness their kinetic energy it'd be great it'd be phenomenal or next time like you open you know like wedding ventures there's a proliferation of wedding ventures i don't know like it's so unique who the heck wants a wedding venture it just goes into a drawer it gets chilling stains and then it's 15 years from now like dude i was at that wedding too remember what happened you know it's it's never it's wedding ventures stink if they had wedding sitters, wedding kiddush Lavana things, like something interesting. The sitters cost too much, that's why. And ventures, everyone wants a venture. Everyone wants to have their wedding venture. So I think we should recycle wedding ventures. Shred them, put them into a big combine, make them into new wedding ventures. And next time you open a wedding venture, it's got that like brown paper and it says, this wedding venture was made with recycled wedding ventures. It'd be awesome. It would be awesome. It'd be like green Judaism, you know? Every rabbi should be driving a like a like a Prius or like a, a Mercedes biodiesel conversion from like chulent scraping. <laughs> just dump the crock pot in there and just like somehow figure out a way. There's so much grease, there's so much junk in there. Or they can make um you know like uh, methane collectors in the benches. Saturday evening they turn them on and everyone's just sitting there and it's it's great. Chef breathalyzers. You come in, you get off on your membership. You come in you're like oh ate a lot of chulent today. Huh? Oh. Sit down, sit down on this bench in the back, back row, you know. <laughs> so um, one of my favorite things about shul is obviously looking over to the pizza and judging by the shul, I really like the shul. I wish there were people sitting. Someone said they were going to sit in the women's section so I can like look and make believe I was in like a normal shul situation. But um, like I have a shul attention deficit disorder and that means that I just, I am a frequent bulletin board checker. I have to be, I'm that guy who knows every single announcement, every bulletin board thing by heart. I have like a horde of a stack of emails from like Muncie Shules that say you can subscribe to this for $36. I've got a stack of those in my seat and I'm reading and I'm like, I got like the, you know, I'm that one guy, like I don't take a stone comish. I take like the Tanakh, the green ones that are like 
this tall and I'm reading through like all that Braveheart stuff, all that like, you know, people killing each other and stuff during like the peaceful part. It's like now it's all about the Mishkan and all that base on Mikdash. I don't want to read that. I want to read about like Shaul and Dove and I want blood and affairs and things like that. You know, I, I want like the Braveheart stuff. But Megillah attention deficit disorder, that's worse. Everyone, like a lot of people I know have this. You're sitting there, you're excited, Purim. You're fasting, but you're pumped. It's going to be Purim, it's great. And within the first paragraph, you're gone. You lost it. You, you, and you can't find your place. It takes me, it takes the whole time to find, but when I find my place, it's like the victory. It's like, wow, I found it. You're sitting there and you're like, it's such a joyous occasion. I always find my place right before that whole 10 names at the same time. Then it's over and I'm done. So last year I was like really bored. I had a Russian Megillah. They say it, you know, I came late. And, um, and uh, I was sitting there and the lights were like directly above. I figured I'd break it. I was doing like those like, uh, like those alligator things in the, in the floor. That was my like entertainment. I know it's like pathetic. What is this guy doing? You know? Actually, like, I, I, I do a lot of, um, apparently I'm pretty holy, because, like, when I have to fill in on, like, in the morning, I, like, garden, I wash my car, I do all sorts of things. And I used to think it was just, like, I can't concentrate, but I want to put on to fill in, but I have stuff to do, and I'm, I'm just such a bad Jew. And so some Chabadnik's like, dude, Baal Shem Tov used to wear, like, to fill in all day long. He was always, like, in the forest in Russia, finding people, fixing random wagon wheels. That's what the Baal Shem Tov did all the time. Actually, last night I did a, um, a uh, Chabad event. And, and, of course, no Chabad event is complete without Paul Shem Tov's story. I was very excited. And there was booze. So that's why more people were laughing last night. I think it was just a gen generic thing. Chabadics, like, laugh at anything. But the booze, like, they were just pounding. And there was a mechitza, which was great, because I was standing right here, and I was kept, like, looking over the mechitza. Because I had to, but, you know, a little more than, than normal. Okay. That's what happens when you do freestyle. <laughs> oh. <laughs> wasn't even on my list. Um, so I go to my cousins in Muncie. They're really friendly. And I'm like that. You know, like, not the black sheep. Like, our family was the one modern family in the family. So we always, like, felt kind of left out. Oh, it's really hot. Is it really hot in here? I'm just sweating like a, like a chassid in the middle of the summer. It's good? It's, I'm just sweating, right? So, water. Actually, speaking of like dripping all over myself today, I, like I like someone made me laugh in the car and I like, coughed up all this water and like landed in my crotch and it like pooled up in the seat and just wet the whole back. So like <laughs> it was terrible. Actually, one time I was driving in my car. And are you laughing? You're smiling, dude. Rock on. No, you guys were like the tough crowd, man. You guys were like the tough ones. So I'm um, one time I'm sitting in my car and I'm eating a donut and for some reason like. They've decided, like, it's the opposite with donuts as it is with hamantash. And hamantash, there's a very high cake to jelly ratio. But donuts, very high jelly to cake ratio. Like, they got cheap on us, man. Because they don't use real fruits. Like, fruits went up, so now they started using that generic, like, congealed Coke jelly stuff. You know, like the bottom of, like, you know, after you, like, spill Coke in it, like, they scrape it off the floor and make it into jelly. That's what jelly from donuts tastes like. And... I'm eating this jelly donut, I'm driving on the highway, and I'm like, I always just like squeeze it out of the little hole, but don't do that at like 75 miles an hour. Oh, <laughs> so I'm squeezing it out of the little hole, and I'm like cruising along, and I'm squeezing it out, and suddenly the donut just explodes. and goes up my arm, up to here, onto like half my face. And I'm sitting there, and I'm like, what do I do? And I drive a stick, so I got one arm on the wheel, and I'm like, holy crap, what am I going to do here? This is really bad. And I'm like, oh, like, you know, the car's pretty dirty because I practically live out of it, but I'm like, I'm not getting jelly. You know, you, that's the worst, when you spill something like soda in your car. So I'm like sitting there, I'm like, oh my god, it's this other time. It's usually like people who make you laugh when you're drinking something. So I'm drinking, I used to be like one of those Mountain Dew people. Extreme, bro, and I'd like have the skateboard and the bikes and just drink like three liters of it a day until someone told me that it's bad for you. Yellow number five, you know, that whole thing, and the, uh, you know, can't explain that. That's a little too raunchy for the younger crowd. He doesn't want me to. He's got kids here, man. So, so, um, but yellow number five does bad things for your, for your kiddies. And, um, <laughs> and, 
And, um, and I'm drinking, and my buddy, like, said something, and I, like, literally spit it all over my windshield and on my, like, speedometer. And every, it, was every, it went all over him. I was, like, one of those babies that just, their mouths explode and, like, sends, like, liquid everywhere. And I was, like, and he was laughing his butt off, even though he was soaked with, like, saliva Mountain Dew. It was, it was terrible. So I go to my frummy cousins in Muncie, and I'm sitting there, and, uh, sitting there at the table, and one of my cousins goes, oh, there's a shotgun. <laughs> Whenever they say that it's a shock. And, and then she reiterates and she says, no, 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 she's not really a shock. She dabbles in shock class. Dabbles in shock class is even worse than a shock because they're like, that means she's like the, the, the cul de sac yenta. <laughs> I don't want to mess with that. She's like, no, 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 she knows people. You're single. You're in the shit of crisis. I see there's like a much more women than men proving the shit of crisis theories right here. Two guys, single guys. Look, there's like four single chicks right here. You guys should be sitting in the women's section. Come on. Right? So, so, like, I'm like, fine, I'll go. I'm like, I was like 25 at the time, 26, I don't know, it's all lumping together. After you hit 30, it all starts to lumping. I'm not 30, though. But um, it's just starting to lump. I look like I'm 30. Um, so I go down there, and they're having that whole, that lunch, the strategic lunch time, the time where you, as a yeshiva buffer, you try and show up so they're forced to serve you. Like that time between lunch and dessert, but they haven't taken lunch off yet. But everyone's forced and nicer together, so you, they're finished. So you sit down at the table like, do you want something? You're not supposed to say yes. But if you're like me, you say yes. You say, yeah, yeah sure. And they're like, no, he wasn't supposed to say yes. We don't want to serve him. We want to eat dessert. So I was there talking to this uh, person that knows people. And I was like, kept looking in. She had some daughters, too. So I was like looking in at the daughters, at the food. And I was like trying to kind of like signal, like try to walk over and be like, oh, see, so you're still eating lunch? Yeah, it looks like a show. So like, yeah, yeah, so, so. What's your learning schedule like? You know, what size shoe are you? Like the whole, the whole Megillah. Okay, how do you drive? Where's your, where did your father's, mother's sister go to shul? You know, the whole like, you know, like really, really detailed. Just like asking all this stuff. And she goes, so I see you, you're an open-minded sort of fellow. And I'm like, oh yeah, sure. I am, yeah. And I'm not, but I am. <laughs> she, she thinks I am. And I'm like, yeah, what makes you think that? She's like, well, you're wearing a blue shirt. It was like, it was like, obvious like I'm wearing a blue shirt of course I'm open-minded because people wearing white shirts are just ignorant fools you know and I'm, and I'm like oh and, and she's like oh so you're not really a half type you're wearing like a suede yarmulke I'm like yeah are you did you just call your husband close-minded <laughs> so I'm sitting there I'm like wow she just you know and, and I'm like sitting there and I'm looking around her house I'm like I see she's got some uh, English novels I see she's got that like yellow shah set on the bottom shelf that's never been used and all the sperm she reads are those like around the Magath table and those like those like Jewish novels that are all about like running away from the Nazis and ending up in Argentina. It's got a lot of those lying around. They're not very literary. I see some of those like um, I see she's a little extra from she's got those like consumer reports with like you know the heads cut out of the women. She's got maybe a couple of Yateds and Hamadias lying around I'm like eh, yeah yeah I, I'm, I'm open minded here. I'm just judging the heck out of her. I don't keep talking, and I'm trying to. I'm trying to get my food. You know, I just want the food. I don't even want to talk to her. And um, what? I just left. Yeah. Okay. The food is most important. The food. I know. How can there be no food here? People are like, they're not expecting food. I'm like, it's a Jewish event. I'm expecting a mincha right in the middle of this all, and food. That's it. And um, and uh, so she's, and then she just like right in the middle. She just stops. She's like, I have the perfect girl for you. And when they have the perfect girl for you, that means they're throwing the nebuch on you, the nebuch of the community that went off the dera, came back on, doesn't really know what to do with her to self. She's getting a degree in medical billing from one of those like, you know, online universities. She doesn't really know how to read yet. Yeah. So it wasn't her. It was an 18-year-old base Yako bus monitor. I don't know how that affected me. I don't know where that happened. But I think it was because she's into the outdoors. I said, she's into the outdoors. This is great. She's like, well, yeah, she went snowboarding when she was 13 and broke her leg, you know? That's it. So I, I was like, oh, fine, you know, I'll meet her, I'll meet her, I'll, I'll go out with her, right? You know, because I was just like, why not, right? It was really like, because she was forcing me into it. Like, I hate those shotguns that force you, but you can't turn them down because they'll never hook you up again. And you know they have, like, that Rolodex of the good people, so you have to, like, go out with the bad people to get to the good ones, you know? <laughs> so, um, so she's like, no, 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 you know, you don't even have to go out with her. Oh, I don't have to go out with her. This is great. Is she going to pay for me? This is awesome. <laughs> nope, not going to pay for you. We're going to invite her to Shalashuda to see your cousin's house. We're not going to tell her she's there for you. <laughs> and she'll sit there. You'll look at her. You'll make eyes. And then you'll 
see if you like each other. I'm like, okay, it sounds like fun, awesome. We get to like, you know, stare at each other. That's great. She comes over. She plays with like the cousins a little bit. I didn't know she was the girl. They didn't tell me. She, she looked like she was 14 years old. So I assumed she was friends with my cousins. And after shop, she's like, so what you thinking? I'm like, I didn't even meet her. That girl, she was 12. <laughs> no, 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 she's 18. I, 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 well, she's, she's turning 18. Yeah, but she's a bus monitor. And she speaks Yiddish. I mean, I, I like Yiddish. Any Yiddish speakers here? What kind of Jews are you people, man? You guys drink Dr. Brown's too? Bus, bus. Bus is bus. Bus is bus. This is Baltimore, yeah? No one speaks English here, huh? So removed from New York that they, so nice they shunned off the value system of New York and created their own selves. Are, they, are you all daughters of the revolution, too? <laughs> Sons of the revolution? No? Not, not that far back. Potomac River. Potomac River? Sons of the Potomac River? South of Oh, I hear it. So, but you're south of the Mason Dixon line here. Yeah. It's like border. Okay, okay, good, good, good job. Democrats represent, um, or Republicans represent. I feel like this is a Republican side and the Democrat side, but I'm not really sure. I, I, I can't tell. But, um, so, uh, I don't know where I was going with that. What was I about to say before you, like, We're going to Yiddish. We speak Yiddish. Yiddish. So, so, yeah, so my dad hates the fact that I date. He wants me to date the 15-year-olds. He's 70. He's like, he's like, you got to date younger, man, because when you're 20, 29, they're going to be like 16, and that's already too old, you know? <laughs> they have, their biological clock is constantly ticking, and they got to have like 20 kids. He doesn't want 20 kids, but like, you know, like three or four, and like, you know, before they're 18 kind of thing. And, uh, and he would always yell at me, he's like, why are you going out with older women? To him, an older woman is anyone within five years of age, either up or, or down. I hear in Baltimore, they pay you to go out with older women, or if you marry an older woman, you get paid, or something of that sort. And... Um, <laughs> I love that. I would go out. I wish they paid us to go out with women. If the shit of crisis was that bad, I should be paid. They should pay for my dinner and they pay me to go out with them. I'd go out with girls every night. Every night I'd be going out. I would be. I promise. If they pay for dinner, I can't even afford to feed myself. It'd be great. So I like going out with older girls. I personally like, I don't know, something about older women. I was hooked up with a 35-year-old recently, but she wants to have kids right away, so I'm not, not down. But um, I don't even know anything about kids. I drove these kids to school once, and I left like two of them in the car while the other one had to make. He was like, no, that's illegal. And, like, they were, I talk, and I specifically said I locked the doors. I'm like, if you guys open up the doors, we're not listening to Marvelous Meadows Machine. We're putting on Coltrane. <laughs> that's what happened. And those kids now for, are forever going to know. Like, they didn't come out, but they're, like, those kids, whenever they, they messed around, I would put on like the Grateful Dead. And those and they're Chabad kids. They're going to be walking in a store one day and be like, dude, it's Jerry Garcia. And the parents are like, how do you know this? Like, yeah, that kid that used to drive us to school. <laughs> what? So, so, my, yeah. It's, uh... <laughs> it's good, good. Keep, keep, keep it rolling. So, my dad calls, I know you don't speak Yiddish, but my dad, like, refers to older women as ice could clap by Shanos. It means... Uh, oh gosh. No, I am against this. I'm all for the older women. I like older women. They're more, more mature. My friends are all like 60. So, so um, I'm, my friends are older than my dad. It's great. My dad's older than his new in-laws, by the way. It's great. That's his, like, really truth. My dad is two years older than his new father-in-law. It's awesome. I love it. I think it's hilarious. He's hanging out with father-in-law's new wife's like, hey, like, no, you wouldn't understand. This is old, from the old days. And um, it's from the days of Dr. Brown's celery soda. So um, he calls them ice kleptoshanas, and I thought I, was, I thought it was one of those terms that he made up. Not, it's for like used car, like American cars. Ice kleptoshanas. You got a, like a like a CD player. You're not in the MP3 revolution. My laptop is ice kleptoshanas. It's five years old, like a dinosaur. I, I was like, wow, that's brilliant. That's pretty cool. But it's it's, it's kind of pathetic on his part. But um, I, I love the old man. He's great. He's one of those. He's one of those guys that's is not like you people. He sits in the back of the shul and speaks Yiddish, argues intently about herring quality. You know, like schmaltz versus matzah herring, and versus the qualities of round versus like tam-tam crackers for scooping. The tam-tam cracker was created to scoop herring. I don't know, I know a lot of you don't frequent kiddish clubs because your women in kiddish clubs are very sexist. They're very chauvinist. I mean, it's a bunch of men eating herring, and usually they have to be like Republican for some reason. They're always a bunch of Republicans sitting around yelling about the Farshtunkin of liberals. They love the Farshtunkin of liberals. And they scoop like, 
they scoop herring. But seriously, like round crackers for scooping herring out of those little tiny tins. You know they charge you like six bucks for like three pieces of herring? You notice that? It's like those little Sabra salad tins with like three pieces of herring. Octagonal crackers actually go in the sides much better. So you don't have to have that extra cracker under there with, to scoop the onions up. You guys don't know. Fish balls? You guys ever experienced the, the, the beauty of fish balls with the little toothpicks? <laughs> They're terrible. They're terrible. I, I don't even know why they were invented. But that's that's shall shoot us. Shall shoot us. And I don't know where Shalashutis came from. That's another thing that bothered me, Shalashutis. It doesn't even make sense. It's like Yumpton. It's like last week, I met some kid, and he kept saying, are you going to tell that joke about Yom Hatzmas? I'm like, what's Yom Hatzmas? Then I figured out it was Yom Hatzmaut. And I'm like, it's not the same. It sounds like Christmas, dude. <laughs> sounds like Christmas. I was, I was like, I was like it's Yom Hatzmaut. I was like, I didn't even know what Yom Hatzmaut was until I got out of I know it's kind of pathetic. I'm going to rag on my yeshiva education. I had no idea what Yom Hatzmaut was until I got out of yeshiva. Yeshiva, it's not even, it's, it's, like, it's like Christmas. It's like, might as well just be lumped into there. You know, Every, everything that was like, anything that was cool was banned. Anything that was cool was banned. You were sitting there, and it, if, if it was nice outside, I said, nope, we have musr today. We're going we're, we're gonna to teach you why it's bad outside. It was always bad outside because there were women who showed their elbows. The women showed their elbows. And I was, it was wrong. It was like, oh, preachers. They would, they, would, um, they would break federal crime to uh, open our mail. Even if it looked like, if it had the slightest inkling of being written by a woman, because they knew women handwriting. Like if the, a, if the eyes had little smiley faces, or like the O's had little dots inside, they'd open it, they'd invite you into the office, and they would read it to you. Even if it was from your mom, from your dad, it didn't matter, they'd read it to you, and then they would like, you know, get you away. At least they read it to you though. I, I, he probably got stuff taken away, for sure. So let, he went to issue with me, and um, I never got I never got mail from girls. I didn't even know how to talk to girls until I was like 19. I had no idea. They didn't teach us. They didn't teach us how. To, they should have taught us. I mean, look, if they expect us to get married at 19 and pop out 10 kids, you would think we'd know how to talk to them. But there was no communication. It was all it was was make kugel, babies kugel, babies kugel, constantly. And kugel, the thing about kugel is at kiddushes. Kiddush is one of my favorite Jewish events. Kiddush is awesome. They. You know now they have that like brownie pan for all the end pieces? You can like get the end piece of brownies at every turn. It goes like this. I think they should make it for Kugel. Because there's that prize corner piece that like an old woman and like a young guy, like a little kid are fighting over. And then always somehow the spoon for the cholent gets knocked in and gets wrapped around those napkins and gets all soggy. It's the worst. Kiddish. It's like anarchy. Seriously, it's the Jewish version of anarchy. I don't know if they do it here or not. In Dallas, I live in Dallas now. Dallas is very friendly kiddish. You sit there and you wait online. You're like, what are these people doing? This is kiddish. I sat in shul for three hours to knock some people over. You know? <laughs> I sat there. I want cocoa to be flying. I want those little sprinkle cookies to be crumbling on the floors. Kids drop them and die for them. I want people, you know, hurting each other. Kiddish. This is not civil, you know. It's, it shouldn't be civil. I mean, Jewish events with free food should not be civil. They are, unfortunately. They are. Thank but it, God. What? Thank God. Thank God. Thank God for the civilness. In Baltimore, it's probably, in New York, it's definitely not civil. We, we had a sushi kiddush once a year. People would come from like miles around. Non-Jews. No one was even Jewish there, I think. It was like they heard free sushi. And they were, seriously, and I was a little kid. I was like eight, so I'd like crawl under people. It was before I, I grew the strength to knock people over. So I just like kind of skimmed around. I had like a stomach back then, so I always like kind of fell down and plopped and then like ran under people's legs and stuff. But you know, if people were seriously like elbowing each other for, for, for sushi, sushi like free, sushi's the biggest ripoff. It's like vitamin water, seriously. Vitamin water? Give me a break. But sushi, they give you like a piece of carrot, avocado in there, and it's like six bucks for the thing. And six bucks is cheap. That's like on sale, it's like nine bucks. And it's not even that good. If you think about each piece when you're eating it, that's a dollar, like 25 each, you probably wouldn't buy it. But people who, cereal sushi eaters are like, no, 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 you can't think like that. You have to think about it like, let's say you're going to buy a steak, and you're spending 27 bucks, but you only buy two rolls of sushi. It's like 18, and it's like a meal. I'm like, I'm never full after two rolls of sushi. It doesn't fill you up. It's rice and seaweed. It's not, it's not, there's nothing. And lox, and now they put cream cheese in a cream cheese seaweed. It doesn't mix for me. It's a pear, crunchy pear. The big thing. You add like a dollar fifty for a little sliver of crunchy pear. I don't know what they put with the crunchy pear and they like if you want it's it's just insane. I like the that's what I like about what? 
That's right. It probably comes out at the same price, though. It probably does. The seaweed, you got to check it for bugs. It's got these little seahorses in there, which I think were made up. It was made up by a costrous organization, I'm telling you. There's no seahorses. He's shaking. It was, right? You think there's bugs in the water? There is? That you can see? That's right. He knows. Scientist? Engineer. Okay. How much, how easy it is for, for it to convince us to like put a hex on everything. It's like, dude, the strawberries aren't kosher. That's right. This bug. I was like, you've been eating strawberries for 60 years. We've had microscopes for 60 years. We've had all this stuff. We've been able to see. And then it's like, well, no, dude, Michael, we can make a killing off this ban. We can ban them and then come in with a cautious organization. It's all, it's all a conspiracy. I think it's all a conspiracy. I think, every, I think everything's a conspiracy. I even watched the 9-11. My dad went nuts when I watched the 9-11 conspiracy movie. I know some people are going to lambast me for that, but I watched that and I was like totally convinced. And then someone smarter than me came and was like, Dude, but this, 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 this makes no sense. I'm like, no, 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 they're so convincing. Don't take it out of me. Because you like, you want to be convinced that it was a conspiracy. It makes life so much more interesting. And it makes us, you know, it's good. It's good times. But, um, but I think, I think the eventual, like, the goal of all the bands and the humras and everything is just to ban women from the public. It's just like, I mean, we already put up an iron curtain at a wedding. Like, I mean Iron Curtain, like Germany Iron Curtain. I mean like Berlin Wall. Like, like someday modern Orthodox people are going to come with pickaxes and just pick it away. It's going to be like a whole like rally, and they're going to be playing Shweki in the background, like a freedom song. We're like, that's it. There's no more separate seating at weddings. I went to a wedding, and everyone was mixed seating besides for the singles. That's why there's a shit of crisis, by the way. People are so retarded. I don't know what happened. I don't know what this, and it wasn't even a from, for me, wedding. It was a from wedding. It wasn't like a, it didn't have the extra IE at the end. It didn't have that extra, like, you know, like, like there was an equal black hat to normal yarmulke ratio. It wasn't like me and the other guy. You know, like when you're in shul, you're in a black hat shul. I don't know if any of you ever go to black hat shuls and you see the one guy without a black hat. You're like that one guy, like the token, like the token modern Orthodox cousin that everyone looks at as you come in. And then you look across the room, and it's like it's like a Lipitor commercial. You like run up and you start <laughs> dancing with each other through the fields. It's like, what are you doing here, man? It never happens like that. It's usually just like a nod, the nod. I love the nod. In see, New York people don't say good job to you; they nod. But usually, it's not even to you. It's usually to someone across the street. But there's that awkward, that awkward moment when you think they're nodding at you, or the awkward, the hand reach, and you're saying good job, and then they like go around you, like in movies when the girl's like running up to you with the tray in the cafeteria, but she goes and puts it on someone else's table. It's exactly like that. I went to a show in Baltimore that that happened. It was so awkward. It, shows are nice in Baltimore. I don't even remember the names. It's great. But I, this guy, like seriously, I was walking right, and he said, he's like, hey, and I'm like, hey, and he walked right past me. And I'm like, whoa, that was really embarrassing. I don't, but he didn't notice, and no one else noticed. So it was good. It was very good. Okay. <coughs> How long was that, by the way? Someone's supposed to be keeping track of time. Oh, good. Okay, I'm keeping going. I'm going. <laughs> I'm going. There's so much here. So much to talk about. Are any of you opposed to drinking on Perm? One, two? Not you. Little kid, really? You don't even drink. Well, you got a black yarmulke on, so maybe you do. <laughs> Sheevish people start drinking young, man. You grow some pace, you can start at four. <laughs> it's great. So you, two people opposed to drinking, that's it? You? You can raise your hand, come on, don't worry, they're not gonna kill you. Anyone else? I have this whole theory that like somehow along the way, like the more left wing modern people get, the more they're opposed to drinking, and they're like the Grinch who stole perm. Seriously, drinking's bad. The cap guns are out because they're dangerous, and they're like guns. It's like, oh my god, we're bringing guns to shul? In my shul, it was like a contest. Like, people, seriously, they brought like real guns with blanks in them. It was very, very right-wing. It was very right-wing. The kids, like, and the kids were drinking. My dad got, one year got in trouble for giving the kids booze. I mean, like, little kids. We were like eight, and we're all <laughs> pounding back into, like, water bottles. We already knew the trick. You know those kids that walk around with water bottles, and you know it's like, it's like vodka and cranberry juice? The water bottle. Come on. This is like Mardi Gras, you know? And um, now, now they've been on, like, from people, somewhere along the line, Amazing Savings found, like, red frat party cups. And someone, like, like from people started buying those. Because they, like, went on sale, and someone, I'm sure one of these, Seven Mile Market got a truckload. 
That's how they wound up. Like in Yeshiva, we had Halloween plates for three years straight. <laughs> we're, like, we're like eating off pagan plates. We had like Merry Christmas, all sorts of things. Like we, you could tell we weren't that Yeshivish because if we were that Yeshivish, they would have crossed out the Chris and it would have been like Miss, like Xmas. Although Xmas, I hear, is even like, I'm sure there's some history people in here, even Xmas means something bad. Nodding? No? Engineer? They don't teach you that stuff. It's got to be bad. It's, gotta be bad. it's, it's probably red in it, that's why. Red is banned. You know that, Stacy. Red is banned. You know that? If you walk in certain neighborhoods, you get bleached with the red. But I wonder if that makes it cooler. You know, you get the tie-dye red then. It's a little more provocative then. It's like a little more, like, you know, risque. Red, just plain red, you know? So, um... I was one time in Israel. I was in Israel a couple of times. I was at, at uh, Orsinath, and I, I didn't go. I didn't go to any classes, by the way. Like everyone who goes to Israel the first time, who goes, to, you go to class for three months, and then it's expected that you like drink Kool Aid, and suddenly out of nowhere, wearing a black hat and a payas. Then in the summer you lose it. Then you come back, become religious, and then you go back to normal after that year. It's in the like. It's it, like it, it's in the like yeshiva protocol. Like, kids have to go, if you don't become more religious in, like, Israel, they, like, you know, like, you, you should get your money back, or the parents should get their money back. The parents are expecting this, they're preparing, they're like, my son is going to come home, and he's going to put a cloth over the TV on Shabbos, and he's going to, like, want to sing all these songs, and, like, we're not going to be able to read the Jewish press anymore, we're going to have to go up to the Yeted or something, it's all going to be there. And, um, so... I participated in a Shabbos riot. I know, like, the Israelis are like, this guy was in a Shabbos riot? I didn't throw rocks. Because the rock thing is not, not there anymore. The rocks, someone, there aren't any rocks left. All the Palestinians used them up. And so they started using, uh, like, potatoes and, like, fruits, like, rotten fruits and vegetables that they didn't check for bugs. So <laughs> it's so hard to check spinach for bugs. So they just, like, have clumps of them and they throw them first. So I was, like, walking down the street and there was, like, a whole Shabbos riot going on. And I got my ponytail, and I got some, like, ponytail, like, you know, Orsamayak friends who, like, walked off the street and found it, you know, it's free meals or whatever. It's the old school form of couch surfing, couch swatting. And we're sitting there, and we're throwing, we weren't throwing anything, but I'm just making up. But, like, I basically said, like, let's go down to the, you know, it was at, it was, it was on Bar Ilan. I said, let's go down to Bar Ilan and Shmuel and Nubby Street, because there's many more cars. And I had it in Hebrew, I had the greatest accent. So we all come running down. There's all these like, little kids, pants flying everywhere. There's the old guys in the silver uniforms. They're running down with us. And suddenly it becomes like a full on mass riot. There's like three cars stuck in the middle. Everyone's yelling in Hebrew. Hebrew always sounds so violent, no matter what way. It, it's like German. It just sounds violent. It's not French. It's not Puerto Rican, Spanish, whatever. It's just a violent language. Everyone's like, Mala, ta, ta, fu. that's all I understood. <laughs> Screaming at each other, zoos, zoos, whatever. And the cops show up. And they're like, yes, the cops are here. Because the cops in Israel, they know the Haredim. They're not bringing normal cops, they bring the women cops. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, yes, the women cops. And all the women, all the women in Israel are just hot. It's just like, it's in the water. It's like Chabad, it's the same thing. And, um, <laughs> and uh, by them, it's in the Chal of Israel milk. <laughs> Golden flu. <laughs> just, that's just wrong, anyway. Um, on so many levels, like the bagel hole. I don't know where they get these names from. Just such innuendo in my head. Maybe I'm just sick. I don't know. Um, why? But uh, so we're like standing there, and the cops come. The women cops are all like gathered around, and they're like screaming and pointing guns. Well, they probably weren't pointing guns, but they had them like over here. And then they all took off their jackets. I'm like, yes, this is great. And me and my buddies are just standing there. Everyone's like going like this. And we're like, yes. Yes, until, until they came up to me and my friend, they grabbed us, put us against the wall, and started screaming in the Hebrew, to which we, of course, responded, Lo medaber ibrit, like in the, in the thickest southern Texas accent possible. <laughs> Lo medaber ibrit can't be just a normal New York accent, it has to be southern. You ever notice that? Like, if you, in order to get out of anything, it doesn't always work, and, and, and she was screaming so loud, she kept saying, I don't know, I don't know, you know, she like, put me down, like, in a heap on the floor, and just like, and there's like, just, rays of light emanating from her, I'm like, she's so beautiful. <laughs> and she's got the gun, and I'm just like, the gun, this is great. I mean, every, I think every guy that goes to Israel for like longer than like two or three months wants to join the army and like, like get some of the, like those, those skirt chicks, you know, the skirt chicks with the grenade launchers. They don't put them in the tanks with you, do they? To like entertain? No? Um, I don't know if you get, I heard those things are horrible, by the way, the tanks. I heard they're just, they're great. Like, no, they're cool when you're like blowing up like, like 
like little villages and stuff. But like, <laughs> see, but you don't get to see. You have to watch like the video. It's like playing Wii. It's not like a real like. I wish like the tanks had like a glass thing that you could watch. You know, you have to look through the periscope, right? That's just. I heard it's loud. You guys like have your iPods set to like disturbed while you're in there. Or that, like, in, it, see, in, in Michael Moore's movie, I know a lot of people are thinking, oh, this guy talking about Michael Moore. In uh, Fahrenheit 9-11, they had that, like, scene where they have the tank, and they're, like, they're playing Let the Body Hit the Floor. You don't know that song. Well, it's a song, Let the Body Hit the Floor. He knows the song. And, and I'm, like, I'm standing there, and me and my breath, but everyone was very serious in the theater. Me and my buddy, like, burst out laughing for, like, ten minutes straight. It was really pathetic of us, but, like, we were just uncontrollable laughter. It was just the song and the bodies hitting the floor and, you know, <laughs> bunkers exploding. I mean, we were like, I, I don't know, I guess we got lost in the whole Michael Moore-ness of it. Um, <laughs> Michael Moore's hilarious, by the way. But, um, boo! Yeah. How long was that? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, okay, okay. Maybe the women can tell me a little bit about this. Like, when I bring a gift for Shabbos, are people judging me by the monetary value of the gift? Absolutely. Absolutely, right? Because right, it takes a lot of, it costs a lot of money to make Shabbos. Someone tell me, like, if you bring, like, flowers that were the cheapest, because I feel like women, I, I always, like, want to go to a store that's not well-traveled by the Jewish women in the community. So here everyone, like, might go to Safeway, so I'll go to, like, Kmart and buy the flowers. Because the women know, they have it, like, mentally memorized. So, like, okay, if... That guy brings those cheap bunches. I know he would be bought the cheapest ones. So I, go, I always go for the middle one in case they like. And then once in a while you forget to rip the tag off. Do they look? Are they look? Are you guys looking? Are you guys like, oh man, this guy doesn't. This guy's not even worth like. He thinks we're only worth like ten bucks. You know, that's what it is. I just bring Moscato the Yeah, back to that. Women love that stuff. They drink it up. Except once in every ten women are like, oh, we like dry red. I'm like. I would have brought dry red. I also like dry red, but I assume if you're a woman and you're orthodox, I know that's awfully sexist. Does anyone here not like, does anyone here, here love Moscato di Asti? Yeah, right there. Single women, no dry red? Nothing. Beer? Cold 45? Look like a cold 45 type. On the paper bag? Yeah, on the stoop? It's great. Do you drive like an 85 Caprice with spinning rims? That like bounces? You have a Caprice? Really? Do it. Wow. With Florida plates, were you a headless driver? <laughs> Those are the best. I steer clear, man. I see a headless driver with a Buick with Florida plates. I'm like flooring it. I'm like out of there, swerving around the road, can't see a darn thing, going like hunched over the wheel, but not really like in the middle of the wheel. Oh, handicap tag, of course, of course. My roommate has a handicap tag because his arm like just hangs. Kind of, I, I, I don't know. I don't count it as handicap. He does. But he won't write it on his shit of profile. I told him, for his shift profile, he should be the one-armed dater. But he, only, he has two arms. I make fun of him. He, he gives me permission, I promise. He went on a $450 date. First date. I know, right? Pathetic, right? Woman, and he wanted to go out with her again. And again, she said, we're going to the Prime Grill. Um, and that's like the most expensive place. I'm like, don't do it. Don't do it. He's like, I'm in love. Like, she just spent $450 of your money. You know, you can't be in love. There's nothing she could have possibly done. I don't care what it was to make that worthwhile. Nothing. Nothing. Unless she paid. But <laughs> then, it, then it wouldn't have been $450. So um, I'm going to take a break. Like a, like a, like a five-minute break. Like one of those, like, the Maymont Leakin kind of things, you know? <laughs> what? What? <laughs> All right, we're going to take an intermission. <laughs> By the way, if, uh, um, if you haven't paid yet, I appreciate everyone who's done. We're doing kind of the honor system. If you uh, snuck in, well... If you're looking, please uh, look at Time Silverberg. Please uh, make your donation to the Heshi Free Dating Fund. And uh, we'll continue in about five, ten minutes. So if you want a breather, if you want to sneak out, we won't, we won't uh, call you out. Anyway, thank you. And Time Silverberg's in the corner. There are business cards on the table um, from satire.net and heshifreedcomedy.com. If you want food, it's at Kosher Bite. <laughs> Do, a Marv, do we have a Marv count? We can make this super yeshivish. No. Nah.